bless you with all that we are. Amen. 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 Do please be seated. So we're going to move into um, our chewing over of the word and Dave has chosen two passages, two very significant passages of scripture, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but they're really powerful scriptures. And um, they're going to be read to you now this morning, starting with the first one from Ephesians. The first reading is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Morning, everyone. Um, this reading is from Acts 1, verses 6 to 10. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he has said these things, as they were looking up, he was lifted and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into the heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus was taken up from you into heaven and will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. So it's a great joy um, to welcome Dave Bellingham to lead us in our reflections this morning on those passages and, and other thoughts that God has given him. And, and actually, it's a real honour. And, and I'm, I'm saying that not just because you gave me a copy of your book, Dave, but because it's true. There's far too much to say about Dave. So I'm just going to say a few things and I hope I haven't got any of them wrong by way of an introduction to those of you who, who are not sure who Dave is. So I know you were born in Horsham. You had a Salvation Army background um, and it kind of almost comes as no surprise that music was therefore dear to your heart, wasn't it? Uh, and you went on to become a very reputable, well-known musician and um, you've been a teacher which we have in common. I think that's probably about it, that and Jesus. Um, church leader, oh, so we've got that in common. Um, and I know that some of you may be aware of uh, a guy called Terry Virgo, with Terry Virgo and Henry Tyler, I think. Yes, yes, that's what I know to say. Smile at me, Dave. He formed a church all those years ago, originally in Brighton, and it was originally called Clarendon. Was that because of where it met? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. And then it became Christ the King until very recently, and it's now Emmanuel um, Church. Songwriting has been massive in your life, hasn't it? I mean, you've written hundreds of, of worship songs, uh, and you've also written some epic books on worship. Um, worship Restored and To the Praise of His Glory, um, fabulous books. 
Uh, I know that after stepping down as an elder in Brighton, you moved with Rosie, your lovely wife, here to Horsham to help and support King's Church in Horsham, which, of course, we all now know is Life Spring. Um, and I don't really know if there's anything else to add. It's just an amazing kind of list of stuff. You are a local leader, a national leader, a speaker, uh, locally, nationally and internationally. You can go online and find his website and listen to his talks. Um, uh, and, and you've just got a real deep longing, a real heart for revival, haven't you, in your heart and for God to move in power by his Holy Spirit in, in the lives of his people, which is another thing we have in, in common, I believe. Dave's most recent book, we even got a picture of it, there you go, um, is at the back. If you haven't bought the, is it eight pounds? Yeah, if you haven't bought eight pounds, write your name on, and then we'll demand eight pounds from you with menaces on all future occasions that we see you. Um, but it's at the back. Um, it's a fabulous book. Um, it's I'm really, really looking forward to reading it, but it's a really good... I think all church leaders have been wrestling with this recently, haven't we, in terms of what is going on? What is going on with world history? And, and it's a super balance to the tendency <coughs> to read Revelations through the now and assume that it's talking about, you know, human history and looking at it through that lens. That's my understanding of the book. You want people to understand Revelation through the lens of the Bible itself, which is a far better way of understanding it. Uh, and, and there's a lovely little, little quote. As so we Christians cooperate with King Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, we will see the Father's plan fulfilled. We can just go home now. <laughs> but we're not. Would you like to come up and I'll pray for you? That would be really, really good, I think. So come up and I'll... <coughs> pray for you so let's let's just pray for dave if you want to reach your hand out and bless him because he's going to bless you father we ask that you would just inhabit dave now in, in his mind and his words and the points that you want to make make them spirit points <coughs> make them jesus points make them points that point to you um help us to have open minds and hearts and ears uh, and spirits as we listen to what dave has to sh has to share and, and Father, we pray that you will, by your Holy Spirit, make a difference mm. to us, Amen. to this church, through the word that you bring to us this morning. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, Kath, for your kind introduction. It's good to be with you. Rosie and I are just coming up to the ninth anniversary of us moving to Southwater. And uh, we actually love living here. And... Um, Really, I know uh, Kath has the same heart and uh, Dave Taylor and uh, the others living in the village to see something happen in Southwater for God. And uh, Rosie and I constantly pray for it. We have a network of people that we're working with, with the gospel to bring them to Jesus. So um, I feel very at home here this morning, just felt the presence of God in our worship and it's great to be with you and to be able to teach you from the Bible. I'm going to talk to you about God being the God of history. Now, it's already been mentioned this morning that we are living in very extraordinary times. Two years of COVID, change of prime minister, the queen dying, Putin ranting, all kinds of things going on which can affect the way we think, can create anxiety and tension within us and wonder where it's all going. Now, I personally, as many of you have, lived through some major historical events that have now become either nostalgic newscasts or history lessons for a younger generation. I clearly remember the death of King George VI and uh, was fascinated by the newspaper pictures of his lying in state with crowds streaming past. No TV in our home in those days. Just the snap and crackle of an old wireless set with the clipped, very English tones of the BBC commentator. Excitement, however, was in the air as the coronation of the new monarch, Queen Elizabeth II was planned and would be televised. On the day, friends and neighbors gathered around the black and white grainy screen of the few people 
who could actually afford to have one. And I remember sitting as a seven-year-old, watching it and getting quickly bored, not realizing that history was being played out before my eyes. Now, through the 50s and 60s, I became fascinated by the world events, famous people, potential wars, political battles. And from the accession of Elizabeth the Great, as we are now calling her, and rightly so, there have been significant events that have affected the lives of nations, continents, social structures, political ideologies, and lifestyles. Rulers have come and gone. Political parties have argued their cause. Social structures have changed. The world since Queen Elizabeth came to the throne is a very different place today. And yet the same old problems exist. Social deprivation in the Western affluent world, as well as the so-called third world, nation rising against nation, the fear of economic collapse, climate change with its related issues, and at a very basic level, anxieties, fears, mental health issues, gender dysphoria and dysfunction and confusion, family breakdown, and it seems the loss of any moral compass. Now the death of Queen Elizabeth, who reigned with grace and dignity through these changes must surely challenge us about the issues of life that really matter. Is there any hope for the world? Will wars cease? Will poverty be eradicated? Will politicians on the world stage get their act together? Is there any hope for humanity? Will the world evolve into a better place? Now, it's significant that in moments of history, like we are going through at the moment, these questions can be provoked. So how should we view history? Now in Daniel chapter two and verse 21, it says this, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belongs wisdom and power. Listen to this. He changes times and seasons. Now, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, what we call the Septuagint, the word there, seasons, is the word epochs. We don't tend to use that word so much now. And it's a word that will appear later on when we look at Acts 1. So I'm taking that as a kind of theme. It comes from the Greek word epochane, which means to pause, to remain, to stand back. And look, there's a, there's a time for reflection. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. Now, these words of Daniel remind us that God is in control, that he is sovereign. And it was Daniel who was able to interpret the dream of the pagan ungodly king, Nebuchadnezzar. He had these dreams and Daniel was able to interpret them. Daniel was God's representative and was able to discern and interpret the signs and the times in which he was living. And it's a reminder to us as a church that we are to have a prophetic voice to interpret the signs and the times in which we live today. So we have a prophetic voice to the world. 
the truth of the sovereignty of God over the earth challenges all humanistic views of history. And in the words of the old gospel spiritual, he's got the whole world in his hands. He knows what's going on in spite of the rebellion and sinfulness of mankind. He is the God of history. Now, this challenges three main secular views of history. And I'm going to call the first one of these the pessimistic humanist view. And this would be based on the idea that history is a random series of unrelated events with no meaning or ultimate purpose. Life is meaningless and is probably going to end with some terrible cataclysmic disaster, either through climate change or some despotic lunatic putting their finger on the button and nuclear warheads being released. Another name we might give for this is the nihilist view of history. It's a view which excludes any kind of hope for humanity and creates fear and anxiety. And many, many people that you rub shoulders with day, to, day by day have this view. And it's reflected in the arts, through cinema, through theatre, through the plays we watch, through the books, novels we may read, and music. You may remember that when there was that terrible earthquake in Haiti in, in 2010, the theme song of that was by uh, R.E.M. And it was a, a song called Everybody Hurts. It's about nihilism. It's about the meaningless and futility of life. Now, the second view, I'm calling it the optimistic humanist view. Now, this puts mankind firmly in control of their own destiny because there is enough good in the human race to evolve towards something better. So through science and education, we can control our own destiny. It is morality and destiny, but without God. And it's a view particularly espoused by the younger millennial generation. And to be honest, it does have some good points. People like David Attenborough and Greta Thornburg have done good work in bringing to our attention that mankind is destroying the planet. And it's good that we know that. We have a responsibility to look after the Earth. Now, of course, this is a moral issue that we should be aware of. And there are other issues such as equality, racism, pacifism, and the essential goodness of man will help us to evolve into a fairer, more responsible society. But can humanity control its own destiny. Now, this brings me to a third view, and this, it is that history goes in repetitive cycles, the cyclical view of history. And man never learns from his mistakes. When I was at school and I studied history, I had to write an essay. History teaches us that history teaches man nothing. And there are many events in history. I mean, what classic one was that, that uh, um, Hitler repeated the same mistake as Napoleon. You may remember, especially if you like Tchaikovsky in the 1812 overture, that uh, Napoleon tried to invade Russia and was defeated not by the Russian army, but by the Russian weather. Now, in the next century, Hitler made exactly the same mistake in the Second World War. And there are many, many other examples that I could quote from history where nations have not learned from previous mistakes and disasters. Now, there is another view, and I'm calling that the biblical view of history. The Bible teaches us that history is moving towards a divinely directed goal, the
the summing up of everything under the headship of Christ. And there are many passages of scripture that express this. And two of them have been read to us this morning. And I'm going to expound that uh, idea. Now, if you were to ask me which is the most important passage in the New Testament, I would say they're all important, every one of them. But Ephesians 1 is very important. It's a very key passage because Paul in Ephesians 1 outlines the doctrine of our salvation. And that was read to us a, a brief snippet from, from it earlier. Tells us what God has done tells us what Jesus has done for us. It tells us what the Holy Spirit has done for us. You read Ephesians 1 from that perspective. It's really faith building for us. But tucked in the middle of this exposition of our personal salvation in verses 9 and 10, there is a statement that lifts the message of salvation out of just our personal deliverance into a whole cosmic dimension. Now, this is very exciting. Paul says, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Now, this is the ultimate goal of history. There will come a time when the world will end as we know it now. Jesus will return, and the whole of history will be scrutinized and judged. Now, the phrase that Paul uses here, unite all things is a complex and descriptive word in Greek. Okay, so you need your Greek hats on now. The word is anakephaliosastai. What a great word. It's one word. We haven't got one word that can translate it. So Paul uses three. So the English translation uses three. Unite all things, anakephaliosastai. Now, in Greek, secular Greek language, this was a word that was used for an accountant who would take the ledgers and look at the income and look at the expenditure and just go through it all and come to the financial conclusion. So when my accountant looks through the income and expenditure and then comes out with how much tax I've got to pay. It's got that kind of feel to it. It's uh, it's a very descriptive word. You can just see the, the old accountant there kind of adding it all up. I'm a careful liar. <laughs> and, and it's a summing up of everything. And this is the word that Paul uses to show us that at the end, when Jesus returns, that's what he's going to do. Bring it all together. Sum it up. And it's great for us to know that our personal salvation is part of a big eternal cosmic plan. Now, the second passage that was read was from Acts 1, and it gives us another perspective on the same thought of God as the God of history and his eternal plan. Now, I've broken this passage down under four headings to help us focus our minds and draw some parallels with the recent events that have been happening in our nation, the death of Queen Elizabeth. Now, the context of this passage in Acts 1 is that it is set between the tomb and the throne. Jesus had been crucified. He was now risen and was about to go back to heaven. The crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension, put those events together, are what we call the glorification 
of Christ. We often talk about Jesus being glorified. Well, what the glorification of Christ is, is those events together and what they mean to us. Now, my first heading is it was a time of mourning and reflection. Now, when someone dies, there is inevitably a time of mourning. It has been extraordinary how the nation has gathered in recent days to express their grief. It was moving to see the pain etched on the face of the royal family. Now, the events of Good Friday for the disciples and followers of Jesus would have been a time of incredible grief and mourning. And we can easily overlook the intensity involved because the biblical narrative is so brief at this point. The disciples had seen the miracles, the healings, heard the teaching. How is it going to end like this? There would have been a time of reflection. Memories come flooding back. Now, this is a very human reaction. And although the time scale may be more prolonged, that is exactly what we've gone through as a nation and on, on a personal level. Uh, when I heard, I immediately began to remember events in my life that uh, were affected by the royal family. One, when I was 12 years old, I went to the dairy show at Olympia and the rumour went round that the Queen was coming. And as a 12-year-old, I was very, very keen to see her. And I fought my way down through the crowds and got right to the front where the barrier was. And I'd seen the Queen. That was amazing. I also remember as a young professional musician being invited to play my trumpet in the Royal Chapel, St George's, Windsor. And although the Queen was not there on that occasion, somehow there was a connection with the history of our nation and the royal family. Now, part of that event that I was playing my trumpet in was they sung the hymn, The Day Thou Gavest, Lord, Has Ended. And for me, there was a kind of irony about singing that hymn in St. George's, the Royal Chapel, with all these flags of empire and commonwealth waving from the rafters, symbolizing the rule and government of Great Britain and its place in the world. And it's a great hymn, and uh, the Queen chose it for the opening song of her own funeral. But when I was in St. George's at that time, I remember thinking of the irony of this situation. The last verse, so be it, Lord, thy throne shall never, like earth's proud empires, fade away. Your kingdom stands and stands forever till all thy beings hold thy sway. Hallelujah. It was a reminder that earthly rulers Governments, despots, and empires are all subject to the ultimate rule of the ultimate king. Everything summed up under the headship of Christ. The time of reflection has revealed stories of the queen's marriage, her humor, her family values, her faith. There's a great story from history that King Henry VIII was sitting in the chapel royal and the great Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was preaching. And Cranmer, who had an uneasy relationship with Henry VIII, began to preach. And he said, Cranmer, beware. The King of England is here. The King of England, beware. The King of Kings is here. Now, our Queen understood that. And a lovely story about her chaplain when she said to him, um, I would love to be alive when Jesus returns. And the chaplain said to her, well, why, why is that? She said, so I can lay my crown at his feet. Wonderful. Now, as a nation, we've been going through a time of mourning and reflection. And this is redolent of the time the disciples would have been going through between the cross and the resurrection. 
but it was also a time of hope and expectation. The disciples were wondering what was going to happen next. Jesus had risen from the dead and he told them that he was about to leave them. However, they still didn't get it. He told them that they were to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And <laughs> they asked Jesus if this was going to be the time when he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And Jesus' reply was, it is not for you to know the times or seasons. Same word as in Daniel, epochs. It's not for you. Now, some, sometimes as Christians, we get preoccupied. And uh, I've written a book on Revelation, and people get preoccupied with the numbers and the times and the seasons. We're not to do that. Jesus said we're not to do that. We're not to be preoccupied with them. Yeah, we're to understand them, but not be preoccupied with them. Jesus was saying, guys, it's the wrong question. There are times and seasons in God's plan, but we are to be focused on what Jesus said. Our issue is that we are to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was anticipating a new era. He was returning to heaven, but the disciples were to continue. It was the line of succession. Jesus was going, but they would continue to do what he did. The parallel is that the queen has died, but the line of succession continues. It was also a time a pageant and reflection. Now, royal occasions are full of colour, celebration and historical reference. We've seen it on our televisions, screens, the Jubilee celebrations. We Brits do know how to do it, don't we? <laughs> uh, it's been amazing. Now, Acts 1 alludes to something that is a much greater pageant than we could have experienced. Jesus gave the clue as to how the succession was going to happen. He would ascend to heaven, the spirit would be outpoured, and they would continue to do what he was doing. They did not realize that there was to be an incredible connection between heaven and earth as Jesus went back to heaven. Now, when I was a little boy, I went to an Anglican school and we used to celebrate Ascension Day and have the day off. I think we should restore that, actually. You know, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate Easter, but, you know, Ascension, the Ascension is the culmination of everything that Jesus did in winning our salvation for us. And when Jesus ascended, it was a great event. The psalmist prophesies it in Psalm 24, in one of the great messianic psalms. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart is not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He will receive the blessing from the Lord. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. That psalm is about Jesus. He's the only one with clean hands and a pure heart. He was the only one worthy to ascend into the heavens. And the wonderful thing is, through our salvation, we ascend with him. Hallelujah. And as Jesus entered the portals of heaven, angels' wings dipped in royal salute, there would have been such incredible rejoicing and joy. Jesus has done it single-handedly, defeated Satan on the cross, brought complete victory and deliverance over the powers of darkness and over Satan. And the pageant in heaven would have been amazing. And Jesus is crowned and given a name that is above every name. And at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue
confess. And Peter, preaching on the day of Pentecost, says this. When the crowds were asking him what was going on, he says, therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of the majesty on high, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. And the this was the power of the Holy Spirit. It's as though the father had crowned his son with the coronation oil and it spilled down into an upper room where the disciples were praying and flooded them and they went out with that crowning anointing to take the world. Hallelujah. Now that's what our experience is and can be. And a time of victory and jubilation. The angels proclaimed, this same Jesus will return in like manner. Jesus is returning. He's coming back. It's our glorious hope. Now, we are not to be a weak minority, but an overwhelming force for the kingdom. Jesus will have a bride that is ready for his coming. Now, a few days after the outpouring of the Spirit, there was a dramatic healing at the gate of the temple. And Peter took the opportunity to preach. And I'm going to conclude with this verse. And what Peter does, we've talked about history, what Peter does in this one sermon is to sum up the whole of the future history that the church will one day be able to look back on. I'm going to read it. Peter says, repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Now, this is the thing, that times of refreshing, epochs of refreshing, seasons of refreshing, may come from the presence of the Lord. That's revival history in a nutshell. You see, we are going through, I believe, a period that has been a period of spiritual depression, spiritual darkness. I mean, we haven't seen a major revival. I've been in revival. I was in the revival in Korea. I enjoyed the outpouring of the Spirit in Toronto and uh, John Wimber and the beginning of the charismatic movement in the late, late 60s, yeah, outpourings of the Spirit. But there is a generation that haven't seen that. Uh, some of our Young millennials uh, at LifeSpring have been saying that. You know, you talk about these things. We've not seen it. We want to see it. And one of our songwriters has just written a, a new song about it. It's great. You see, we should live with an expectation that there will be a season of refreshing. Peter promises it. It's revival history. And there will come the time when it's so great that Jesus will own it and come back. And that's what we're looking for. Now, I know there are all sorts of other things. Read my book and you'll see what those other things are. But uh, for us, we are to be filled with the Spirit. We are to believe for times of refreshing. We are to live not with despair and anxiety, but in the light of God's sovereignty and be ready for Jesus' return. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. I'd like you all to stand. The great promise is that we can be filled with the Spirit. And my prayer for you as a church here, and it's been lovely being with you. I'm feeling your warmth. It's great. God's got big plans for you. He has big plans for you. You can reach Southwater. You can help reach the area. Father, I want to pray that the power of your Holy Spirit will flood each one of us that it will not just be something that we talk about, read about, be nostalgic about, but, Lord, that we in our day will know what it is to live in the light of your glory and of your power. And I pray, help us to be witnesses to these great truths 
that people out there in their anxiety and their fears and their nervousness about the future, they need to know these things. Help us to be good witnesses. You said you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Jesus, we ask you, flood us and fill us. Amen. Amen. David, say something.